Thanks. So again, warm welcome to everyone to our mid-year 2023 analyst briefing on the European digital health ecosystem and more specifically its key trends. Um, what does that mean for the second half of this year and I guess 2024? As I said, this is a report that we published a few weeks ago, um, but of course we dwell the pause with the summer vacation period in Europe. My name is Julius Salaberry. I'm the CEO and the founder of Galen Growth. I sit in Basel in Switzerland, uh, usually alongside Sarah, and it's our pleasure today to bring this topic to you. Um, Galen Growth, for you less familiar with us, is the leading digital health data and market intel insights provider to industry and investors. We uh, spend our lives delighting numerous blue chip clients, and you'll find all those details on our website. And we have global reach uh, with offices in the US, in Europe, where I'm sitting, and of course, in Asia Pac, Singapore, uh, our country of initial origination. Healthtech Alpha powers all of our mathematic research. Uh, it is the global leading digital health private market detail, data intel insights platform uh, used by industry and investors and startups. Uh, it's more data than anyone else. We catalog more digital ventures than any other platform out there. We've built a best-in-class taxonomy, uh, which means that you always find what you're looking for, at least we said from some of the other platforms out there. And of course, our state-of-the-art workflow means that you're very efficient in accessing that. And, uh, and of course, uh, making sure that your productivity or your team's productivity is up. And one of those new state-of-the-art workflows that nobody else has is user-generated reports, allowing you to create PPT or PDF reports directly from the data that you have shortlisted in a list or a workspace. And of course, all of that is backed up by the Almash expert team of Galen Growth. Uh, the other bit of good news is that it's of course also available now through Valuate, which is a Nostella company and also a leader in healthcare data. It services most of the pharmacos on their molecular or molecule data, and therefore um, they are um, positioning Healthtech Alpha with the industry alongside their leading products. So to this particular report, uh, Sarah kindly is showing you where you find it in the platform. Well, there you go. Um, so if you go into the platform, basic account will get you there. And you then go to the menu on the left-hand side, you click on reports and you click on thematic research and you will get to that report as well as many other reports. Our focus today is on the European one, uh, mid-year 2023, sort of midway point through the year. Uh, it's a biannual report. So the next time you'll see this is, of course, in January for the full year. Um, today's particular analyst briefing is based on the 70 plus pages of data, tables, charts, etc. that you'll find in the European report on this particular uh, library. And of course, our scope is, as usual, a look at digital ventures that are private and were incorporated after 2002. Um, also available in that series, as you can see on your screens, is the Global Report, which is a free of charge download for anyone. And of course, our North America and Asia PAC reports, which are for our premium customers only. Now, before we kick off with uh, some of the insights, uh, one important thing is we love your questions. But we prefer having questions. It makes this a lot more interactive, a lot more dynamic, and a lot more fun to do. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens uh, so, to, so as to ask your question. At least then we know it's a question. And of course, we can also uh, try and answer these uh, live, either verbally or in writing, depending on who's talking in the Gale and Growth team. Let me introduce you to Sarah Schmartenberg or Dr. Schmartenberg. She's our head of research and analytics for Europe and North America and plays a significant role in the um, creation or the anal analysis, sorry, behind these reports. Sarah, welcome. Thank you once again for joining us and bringing to life these reports uh, through these analyst briefings. Let's dive in. Um, let's start, if we may, with a bit of a quick global context uh, around funding volume and total funding in dollars, largely just to give people an anchor point when we start talking about Europe, which, of course, will be the rest of this webinar. Absolutely. Happy to do that. Happy to be here. Welcome to everyone from my side. Um, let's let's jump in. Um, so this first half of the year, when it comes to funding, global funding, has begun to slightly stabilize since last year. That means global funding was down 49% year on year. That's comparing H1 2022 to H1 2020-2023. So 
Seems like a big number. Yes, and it is a big number. However, um, like I mentioned, when you're looking at um, the decline from the peak in 2021 going down in 2022, um, keep in mind these are only H1 numbers, not annual numbers as the other ones. Um, what we see is there is a little bit of stabilization um, going on. Um, globally, you had um, a total of 624 deals, which is again um, a decline, but um, we are seeing some sort of stabilization across the globe. Okay, that's good. That's a nice bit of context. And uh, we've seen different various iterations of these numbers. Um, most of them are um, iterations from uh, uh, other reports that are seriously uh, underreporting. So although the news doesn't look too great, it's not as bad as some people are reporting it. So if we then drill into European funding, um, what does that look like? How does that compare to the US? And why do we think um, the dynamics are slightly different? Um, the dynamics are different, Julian, because the global, as I mentioned, is minus 49%. If I click over to the next page, what we see in Europe is minus 53%. So Europe is dec has declined um, more year on year, H1 um, to H1, um, than the global um, numbers. The, um, the number of deals have also declined, um, not quite as, hard, as bad, but with minus 42%. Um, there's also significant declines with not just that the deal value has reduced, reduced, but the number of deals is also indeed very much lower than last year. And what we're going to, I'm going to jump in um, and give you a picture of, of what this means within Europe itself. Um, the, the distribution of funding, right? United Kingdom took the top spot again as far as funding. Remember last year that was France largely driven by the um, the doctoral lid deal um, with over a half a million first half of last year. So UK is back on top with Germany taking second place. Um, and those two capture um, a 50, 53% right, of all the, the funding in Europe. Both UK and Germany are, however, significantly down on the year. Um, Switzerland is kind of the, the bright star of this first half of the year. Um, up 31% from last year, All right? So that's where the funding is going in Europe. And if we look across um, on a quarter by quarter basis, right, what we're seeing is um, that that decline from Q2 2021 in Europe. And th again, these are um, European numbers that you're looking at. And the numbers, um, both the deals, number of deals, which are, are in blue and the deal value, or sorry, and the total value, which are the blue bars, have are declining, but 2023 is starting to stabilize in Europe, right? So that's that shimmer of hope, glimmer of hope um, that perhaps um, it is starting to stabilize, and the we're not or we're starting to see um, the bottom of that decline. Of course, the deal value has has gone up and down over that um, of that time period. Um, at the moment, Q2 had um, an uptick in the in the deal value average deal value. Um, but again, the number of deals really was at a low point for Q2 2023. You asked previously about how it compares globally, comparing it, for example, to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, or excuse me, to North America, because we, we typically group all of that together. Um, North America, for example, um, began to see a rebound in 2023. Over Q1, Q2, the, um, the total deal value started to, to come back up. And that's where we see Europe is lagging as it typically does, lagging slightly behind the US. So as long as the numbers keep coming up slightly, we're not talking about a big rebound, but um, coming back up, having reached the bottom, then we hope to see Europe doing the same thing at the end of this year. I have to give you a pink though, August uh, Q3 so far has not looked very good. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that Q4 is going to pick back up for digital health in Europe. Yeah, indeed we are, and we'll see what uh, what that means uh, as we start to continue to track it. And of course, a lot of people can continue doing that by going simply into Health Tech Alpha uh, and looking at the numbers for Europe um, on a Europe individual basis, and of course how those grow. But that's just, I guess, total funding numbers, and we can fall into the trap of getting overly excited about what those numbers are doing without really getting into the details. So that's what we'll do today. Um, I noticed in our analysis that once again, IPO landscape in Europe is 
bear, in fact, nil to report in the first half of 2023. Um, does that mean that exit activity uh, in the first half of this year in Europe was also non-existent? Um, IPOs were absolutely zero. Um, but I think we've talked about before, um, looking at those um, exits, there's definitely a lot of exit activity going on. First of all, you'll see here on the left, the mega deals, very few um, in H1 2023, but the focus on the M&A. Um, H1 2023 reported 21 M&A deals um, for the first half. That's compared to an annual value in 2022 of 55, right? So it's tracking quite well in 20 um, compared to 2022. Now, as we've talked about before in these webinars, right, what we have is kind of a perfect storm going on with um, the amount of funding available um, being so low right now. Um, ventures that need funding can't grow unless they um, get some get some cash into their pockets, right, are a bit ripe for, um, for acquisition. If they can't uh, fund themselves, then they look for someone um, for the acquisition deal. So we do expect to see those M&A deals continuing as um, the funding situation um, remains low, more or less, because the digital health, health ventures, they're quite mature, right? With all the funding coming in during the pandemic, they were able to grow, get evidence, build clinical evidence, and now um, they're, they're ripe for picking for M&A. Yeah, and um, I suspect we'll continue to see the same trend uh, for the back half of 2023 um in europe anyway at least so listen you mentioned germany was ranked number two um unusually so we would then find it in the top five but not number two so that's encouraging um i know you've been looking at the german digital ecosystem uh, fairly closely of late um what's driving that um newfound energy let's say in the german digital health ecosystem is it entirely due to diga which seems to be held there as a poster child of of how a you know a, an ecosystem should function, uh, or there are, are there other drivers there? Um, well, you're right. I did look into Germany recently for a um, report that should be um, in a publication coming out in January, hopefully. Um, but what we see is the German ecosystem is currently very subscale, right? Um, if you look at the number of private active digital health ventures per million inhabitants, right? Look at the size of Germany and then look at their size of the digital health ecosystem. They're really incredibly subscale compared to um, a lot of their European counterparts. Switzerland being um, at the top of the charts, right? Way outpowering um, the rest of Europe. A lot of it because the pharma headquarters are oftentimes here in Switzerland. Sweden, the UK um, taking third place in um, in Europe, and then these are just selected countries. So Germany isn't number four; they're they're a bit further down on the list. Um, Germany it was only five point one, right, compared to to twenty five, which was in France coming out coming in just behind Germany, right. Compare that, for example, to the U.S. Um, the U.S. has double the amount of ventures per inhabitant, right. So the subscale, but what we see is that Germany is really growing. Um, looking at the share of funding value for the European funding, uh, excuse me, Germany has been gaining share over the past um, four and a half years, right? To capture 21% of the share in H1 2023. So really coming out strong. Now, is that because of DIGA? I mean, you can argue both ways, right? Germany did take a lead with their DIGA program. Um, whether or not that has been successful is of course a, a matter of contention at this point. Um, and we don't know what the future will bring for that but it in, indeed seems to have spurned a lot of growth. Um, looking at digital therapeutics in Germany, right, which is kind of, the, which is really the focus of the DECA program. Um, oops, and I apologize, I, I wrote that report in German, so these, the, um, the country names are in German, France, UK, Germany, Europe, the US, and then the global. Um, Germany, 10% of all ventures in Germany our focus on digital therapeutics, right? So, so it's definitely a, a big topic um, in Germany right now, and we hope that all that enthusiasm will spread to the rest of digital health um, within the German ecosystem. As you can see, some of our Swiss uh, counterparts are getting quite excited about um, you sharing that Switzerland had done um, <laughs> better than expected, or certainly better than trend. Um, question is, any insights to why there's been that bump in Switzerland? 
Um, as I mentioned, you know, Switzerland is headquarters for um, a lot of pharma companies, right? There are a lot of biotechs growing and uh, coming into Switzerland in order to profit from the ecosystem. Um, we sit in Basel. There are a whole lot of accelerators and programs for um, for digital health, as well. The universities are all very much poised and focus on um, on health and the life sciences. So that's what I would say. That's probably why you see that uh, huge number in Switzerland. It's really the focus on the life sciences um, within within the ecosystem here. Yeah, I mean, there's there's an awful lot of um, of qualified brain power as well in Switzerland, leading to innovation being driven. And of course, Switzerland does always rank in the top one, two in terms of most innovative countries, um, which uh, I think is not testament of this, but certainly uh, one of the one of the drivers there. Um, we would certainly encourage um, Suzanne to uh, log in to Health Tech Alpha and look at uh, Switzerland more specifically. She wants to understand who some of the what are some of the highlights, some of the drivers, and who are the star pupils in the class when it comes to uh, to digital arts in Switzerland. Let's um, let's drill in a bit. Um, I like to look at other uh, facets of digital health, which I think are very important in terms of understanding the, the ecosystem in, in this region. Um, so I'd like to look at, uh, with your help, you know, what's happening at a therapeutic area level. Um, you know, is it still oncology that's knocking the ball out of the park? Have we seen cardiovascular bubble backs? So these are some of these questions that um, uh, I think are interesting to answer. And of course, uh, once we've had an understanding of the, the therapeutic area, it'd be good to obviously start looking at um, uh, you know, digital health clusters, or more specifically, which particular capability of digital health are attracting the most funding. Uh, and uh, you know, are we seeing a shift as a result of some of the uh, volatility in digital health? Um, all good questions. Let me take them one by one. <clears throat> First of all, looking at therapeutic areas. Yes, cardiovascular did see a bump up in H1 2023 compared to H1 2022. It was one of the very few therapeutic areas, if you look in the report, that saw an increase of funding um, year on year. However, um, all, all of the therapeutic areas here are kind of clumped at the bottom. Okay, this is half year results. These are full year results. Um, but oncology still bubbles up onto top, onto the top, right? Oncology has been on the top for the past five years. Um, a very research intensive um, therapeutic area. Um, and it, it did indeed capture 14% of the ecosystem, right? Looking at um, therapeutic areas across all of um, the funding, European funding, uh, ventures that were agnostic to disease area took 34% of the funding, oncology 14%, followed by mental health, and then cardiovascular and neurology. Um, what's funny, hepatology, jumped into the top um, five therapeutic areas, right? And that wasn't just with one venture. There were um, three or four ventures that raised significant funding rounds in um, in hepatology, liver disease. So um, that was kind of a newcomer and um, a nice surprise to see the variety and to see how digital health is really coming and working its way into um, the entire ecosystem. So that was that's a therapeutic area landscape, what it looks like. Details can be found in the report. If we go into digital health clusters, right? Looking across um, the um, digital health clusters, the top funded cluster was medical diagnostics, right? Very much a um, a, a European um, phenomenon. It's not what you see across the globe. Um, typically, um, we I think in the US it was health management solutions, and medical diagnostics came to the top. Um, followed by telemedicine research solutions, right? And then uh, research solutions was more or less tied with health management and health services search. Um, health services search was number one last year. Um, and again, that was that Dr. Lib deal, the half a million dollar Dr. Lib deal. Um, so that was why it was number one. And if you don't mind, Julie, I'm gonna jump um, and look a little bit deeper into Volta Medical to show- No, let's do that. Let's do that. The, um, what the, uh, platform, a little bit about the, the uh, Health Tech Alpha platform. If I am, um, all these are linked. So if you guys download the PDFs, um, you can jump then straight into Health Tech Alpha. And I'm going to log in because I do have an account. Okay, let me uh, let me in. So Volta Medical um, took the the number one funding deal in medical diagnostics, um, and this is a French venture, um, a French 
um, venture that has um, very much um, exceeded um, and has reached quite a quite a high level of maturity looking across our proprietary analytics, right? What we see is the venture maturity is over 50. So it's getting um, above, above the average maturity level momentum, um, but it's in a relatively weak market, right? The French ecosystem is not known for um, medical diagnostics. So, um, but the innovation, right? It's bringing significant products onto the market. Um, they have, the evidence signal is, um, is incredibly high because they've run clinical trials, have regulatory approvals with the FDA, um, along with those peer re reviewed publications, right? So very much a, um, what do we call it? A top-notch um, digital health venture looking into um, cardiac electrophysiology and using artificial intelligence, right? To help with um, diagnosis for that. And their solutions can be found very much um, across Europe. I come in. Uh -huh. um, and let me let me try and fix that. Yeah, right. they, there we go. The been can be found, that done with that yeah, couple. Cool. Um, in, in the U.S. as well as across Europe. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, they do have multiple um, not only reg registrations with the FDA, but as well um, um, FDA approvals on their um, diagnostic devices. Right. So um, just a quick view onto a venture profile. Be happy to show um, some of you guys more or log into healthtechalpha.com, create your free account, and then you have um, five days to, to trial and dig deep into the profiles of those ventures that um, that you know or may not know. Cool. Yeah, and of course, that's one uh, one of many, but I always like to dive into ventures I'm less familiar with and understand uh, why are they attracting funding despite the volatility in the system. Uh, and we'll come back to that uh, soon. But uh, Volta is uh, a fascinating venture um, and uh, representative of the level of innovation coming out of France, which I certainly hardly ever recommend everyone to look at. Um, one of the other things I like looking at, um, I guess, is my ex-corporate hat on, uh, Sarah, is looking at um, uh, partnerships. For me, digital health, an innovator to you know to scale needs to build partnerships. I mean, the lion's share of digital ventures are B two B or B two B two C models. Um, so, so what does partnerships look like um, in the first half of this year? I mean, how much of a role they played um, in in I guess the the, the the continued momentum of the ecosystem? Which sectors have been more prolific at building partnerships? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Partnerships um, across Europe tend to be um, European ventures aren't partnering as much as as much as other ventures across the globe. Um, can't really explain why, um, to be honest. Other than looking at um, the European numbers as far as partnering, and looking at the rest of the world, um, right? We see that Europe is only only captures seven, nine, ten, eight percent of the total partnerships. So either they're not talking about them or they just try to grow themselves without the partnering. And, and really in this climate, current climate right, of digital health with not as much funding, um, the, there's a lot of focus right now on clinical evidence. You know, you have to build evidence in order to prove that your, your solution works. Partnering is really a lifeline, right? It's, it's really partnering with large corporates or partnering with other ventures, right, to work together to get... Um, access to patients, right, and to get access to perhaps different markets in order to build, you know, the evidence of your solution is really quite a lifeline. So um, anyone out there listening who's in a digital health venture, um, partnering is really, is really critical for success at the moment since you can't get any, or since venture funding is, is quite low. But what we saw with um, partnerships is there was a buildup of partnerships <clears throat> through the end of last year. And this year, is, um, that has declined again significantly. So um, there's really no good reason for the client partnerships other than we expect that it's just um, a normal fluctuation. There was a bit of a, a peak at the end of last year, but those numbers should come up again by the end of the year, right? 
And um, we certainly hope that the European ventures, as um, they're maturing, right, because Europe is definitely about five years behind the curve, um, behind sorry, North America, at least, for venture maturity, we really um, expect to see that number of partnerships pick up and this percentage um, we hope to see grow again. Great. Um, Sarah Banovich uh, has put a hand up. I'm assuming she has a question to ask. I will. Oh, the hand's gone. You can write it in the chat. Um, if she doesn't have a question about partnerships, let me let me continue a little bit then about um, who's or where the partnerships are. Right, if we look across Europe, um, we can break it down by industry vertical and understand who the ventures are partnering with. Right, with 21% um, of those partnerships um, with pharmaceutical or biotech companies. Right, so they're taking um, yeah 50 per. A fifth of um, of the partnerships. After that, then it's the venture to venture partnerships, um, really helping to build kind of platform solutions, right? Get together so you don't have um, so many piecemeal solutions. Um, and then after that, healthcare providers, um, including hospitals, right? Which which help get access to, to patients. Um, so that's really the outlook of of what the partnerships look like um, within Europe. And again, like what I mentioned, Europe, um, H1 2023 only had 9% of the global partnerships, right? Seven, almost 70% of those were in North America, right? But Asia Pacific is still 20%, so much higher than the European numbers. Um, so we really hope to see that grow over the next um, year or two for Europe. Good, well, thanks. And it's uh, interesting to see who, um, if you look at some of the sectors and who the most prolific ones are, um, some of the re repeat offenders, so to speak. Um, I just want to touch on on funding strength, not not necessarily to re revisit funding, but really to look at you know the, what's the state of the nation in terms of um, the funding rounds, and therefore what ventures have been able to pick up by funding, and therefore um, you know how stressed is it? Simply on the basis that you know we. Generally speaking, a raise is you know about an eighteen month runway, and therefore, if we look at it through the lens of who has raised in the last eighteen months, you know how much of the how much can we assume the rest of the ecosystem is potentially struggling a bit? Sure. Um, the what you're talking about is what we usually um, refer to as funding strength, right? Looking at who has raised um, and how long has it been since they've raised. And um, if we look at ventures across the globe by region, right? Um, first of all, we take only ventures that were incorporated after 2012 that have had a funding raise, right? So we're not gonna look at the ones who, who don't talk about funding or who are bootstrapped. Um, the ones that have raised funding in the past 18 months, which we consider to be a critical limit. Um, North America, only 35% of ventures in North America. 26% of ventures in Europe and 21% Asia Pacific, right? So it's really a stressed situation right now with more or less three quarters of the ecosystem in Europe needing to raise funding, right? Of course, you can look um, by funding stage, right? Um, the early stage series A ventures who typically do have a longer duration between funding rounds, right? Having 21% um, of those raising in the last 18 months, the growth stage, which is quite critical for having funding, only 34% um, have raised. Late stage ventures have been a bit more successful in Europe. I'm um, seeing, um, seeing that um, over the past 18 months, 67%. Um, so there's a lot of stress in the market right now. Um, and, and we hope that certainly in the next half the year, then um, the funding will pick up again. Otherwise, continue with the partnerships, and um, we expect to see a lot of M and A. Yeah, and of course, people simplifying their business models, uh, stripping costs out, and you know we've seen that with Humor announcing uh, headcount uh, reductions, and of course, uh, in terms of funding stress, none more spectacular than Babylon's little journey over the last uh, few months of uh, will it be merged into a Swiss entity or will it not? And it appears mm -hmm. these days so. Everyone's no doubt watching that one, um, which leads me on, therefore, one of my favorite topics of the last uh, last 12 months, really, and that's proof points. 
Um, and of course, definitely matter no more than they have ever mattered now than ever before. Um, so what can you tell us about clinical evidence in Europe then, Sarah? I mean, let me take the opportunity to plug unashamedly um, the analysis we've just published on the state of clinical evidence in digital health across the globe. Um, but let's take a little dive into what it looks like in Europe to give everybody a sense of um, how we look at it. And we're as transparent as we can in terms of how we look at it. Uh, but of course, and of course, totally data driven. So there's no subjective opinion into whether it's clinical evidence or not. But keen to understand what does Europe look like and how does it compare? Um, it, when we talk about clinical evidence um, within the Health Tech Alpha platform, we have what's called an evidence signal. And that is made up of um, clinical trials that the venture has applied for, any regulatory approvals ac across the globe. Doesn't include reg um, registrations in the with the FDA, of course, those aren't any sort of approvals. And we look at peer reviewed publications, right? So those are the three criteria. Of course, um, the clinical trials and approvals are weighted heavier than um, peer reviewed publications. And what we see is, um, if we look at the table in the lower left, Europe comes out on top, right? European ventures have been very busy um, producing clinical evidence or producing the, those pieces of evidence over the past um, half year, because if you look at our end of year, 2022 end of year reports, um, the Middle East was still on time, right? So it's good news. Um, Europe has been busy. Um, a lot of the ventures are focused on the, um, the digital health clusters that are more heavily need clinical strength because not all clusters do, right? We have what you see here, medical diagnostics, patient solutions, remote devices, right? Less so health management solutions, wellness, telemedicine they all require showing proof that your solution works, right? Uh, online marketplaces, for example, um, and uh, health and sure tech, those type of things, they don't need as much evidence, right? So, so there is, isn't that all ventures need it, but the ones in the, the top um, digital health clusters in this area really require proof that the solution is safe for patients and it's effective for patients. Okay. So Europe comes out on top, and what we see, we look across the five top funded therapeutic areas for this half of the year. And as we go deeper into um, the very specific therapeutic areas, typically we see a higher proportion of ventures that have an evidence signal greater than 40. And, and that um, threshold of 40 means they either have one clinical trial, they have one regulatory approval, or they have at least four peer review publications. So 60% of ventures who focus on hepatology have um, significant clinical strength. That number is 48%, um, 47% for oncology and cardiovascular, um, down to neurology, 38%, and mental health, 20%. Right? So Europe is very strong in this area. Um, and, um, and what you see is 25% of medical diagnostic ventures have right, proven clinical strength, 24% of patient solutions, that includes um, digital therapeutics, 10% of remote de devices. So, of course, some ventures are too young, are still building it, they don't yet reach that threshold, but there's a significant portion within Europe that do reach the threshold. So it's very much a strong point um, for Europe. And um, Julian, I did skip over it before what we talked about, um, when we talked about partnerships. Partnerships are a great way to build clinical evidence for a venture. And um, we can go back and look at the most partners, most active partners in Europe, right? I did um, prepare that for today. It's in, of course, the report. And, and you really see um, kind of going back to uh, why, why is Switzerland such a hub? You see the most active partners, Rush takes number two. Novartis, both of them had to have headquarters here in Basel, right? And they're really um, very active in partnering in digital health, as well as AstraZeneca and the NHS takes the top spot, right? Um, as far as this year, right? It's only, there were only six months in the first half of the year, as always. Um, so they, um, Roche, AstraZeneca, and Novartis each announced two partnerships. Um, the NHS won for it, Pfizer hasn't yet, but I think um, I think they announced some partnerships in July and August. So that's what's been going on in digital health in Europe. That's cool, and thanks for coming back to that. It's only great to see some of our immediate neighbours and their continued activity. Uh, this question here from anonymous. Um, 
I'll take the first half. You can take the second half. You can see on your screen, Sarah. Where do these data come from? How do you collect the data on funding runs brackets, crunch base? Um, well, let me start with, we don't touch crunch base with a barge pole. It's uncurated, unreliable, and usually inaccurate. Um, back to your question. So all of the research you've seen today in every one of our reports um, is powered by Healthtech Alpha. Healthtech Alpha is uh, to be found at www.healthtechalpha.com. It is the global leading digital health data, intel, and insights platform used by uh, many, many uh, investors, corporations, uh, big consultants, et cetera. Now, that data is uh, curated by the uh, Gale and Growth Research Team, and our typical sources are primary research, secondary research, crawlers, of course, from uh, very reliable, reputable sources that we've identified. Uh, we do a lot of client work, whereby uh, every time we do research for our clients, uh, we sharpen our eyes and improve and augment our data. A lot of our clients come to us to ensure that their data is factually and accurately represented on our platform. Uh, for example, large pharma goes do. And of course, last but not least, a lot of digital ventures uh, come to us to ensure that they're factually accurately uh, represented. Since that's that that's data across all the fields that you've seen um, uh, today. So funding rounds certainly included in that. Uh, and we curate uh, everything before it goes live. Um, so we don't end up with uh, what you end up with at Crunchbase. So that's Healthtech Alpha. And if you haven't seen it for yourself, please do so. You can log in, create your own account and uh, navigate and get a sense for the sheer breadth and depth and power of the platform. As for clinical evidence, Sarah, let me let you answer that question. Sure. Again, we look at uh, clinical trials, regulatory approvals, and um, peer review publications. Those are, for the most part, all publicly available information that we can get by looking at different sources from across the globe. Um, regulatory approvals, of course, you have to check global uh, regulatory bodies, um, including um, uh, European notified bodies. Um, but it, it's definitely something that uh, we pride ourselves on, being able to find that information from reliable sources and, um, and collecting it all in the Health Tech Alpha database. Thank you, Sarah. And Suzanne's kindly asked this question. There's a lovely segue to, I guess, our final, um, I guess, let's say crystal ball moment in, in terms of how we see things going forward. So thanks for the question, Suzanne, which is, do you expect the recent insolvency of the layoffs leading to an even higher decrease in investments? Or are you expecting a kind of recovery next year? Let me have a stab at that, but then Sarah, let you, uh, let you bring uh, some more detail. You know, for, for, for me, for us at Gale and Growth, you know, the macros remain unchanged. Um, the U.S. economy is still going strong, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of worrying signs across Asia and, and across Europe in terms of macroeconomics. Um, and then, of course, Ukraine conflict is nowhere near being solved. And, of course, we've got the U.S. elections starting in November. Sorry, the, the, well, I guess it is a full election starting okay. in November, so that's going to add a, a ton more volatility in the system. So the macros are unchanged. So we certainly expect much more reality to continue to come to the fro in uh, in digital health. I don't think other tech sectors are much different, but I'm going to focus on digital health because that's what I know. Um, so you'll see continued consolidation, really venture to venture type M&A, um, as I guess you know they find ways of improving their business models or certainly um, raising the relevance of their business model by bringing together two capabilities and two businesses. And I'm sure you'll know that um, economics tend to eat egos for lunch. So, um, you know, two CEOs couldn't get on two years ago. Then um, this year, um, the economics will make things a lot sweeter looking in terms of trying to do things together. Um, we'll see a continued, when it comes to funding, we'll see a continued essentially extensions of existing series. The thing that got labeled as unlabeled funding, it's not unlabeled at all, it is extension. So if you've done a series A, you'll probably do an A1, an A2, and A3 going forward, largely because the investors do not want to see a um, reduction in valuation um, because they have to mark down their books. And so they prefer doing extensions of existing rounds. And we'll see some continued debt funding where, of course, valuation doesn't come into play. Uh, so we'll see more of that going forward. Uh, the funding stress we've touched on. Um, I can't see that improving uh, going forwards. Uh, we'll see that at the end of the year, but I think we'll continue to see stress building in the system. Um, not to forget, of course, that 
the VC value chain is completely constipated, there are no exits. And so um, VCs are needing to find ways of um, somehow realizing value on their portfolio uh, as LPs continue to badge them to uh, recognize value on their uh, cash investment. So those are, for me, the kind of reality points that we will see continued manifesting themselves in the ecosystem. Um, to add to that, the focus on proof points won't go away. Uh, you know, gone are the days of wonderful stories raising vast amounts of cash, as has been proven by um, ventures such as Babylon. And now we're looking for proof points and uh, investors are looking for proof points and we know Pharmaco is looking for proof points. So uh, that will be a massive focus and a short plug for everyone. Our next analyst briefing uh, towards the end of this month's date to be announced very soon will be on clinical evidence and we will have with us an expert um, to talk us through really the diligence you should go through to achieve uh, clinical evidence or certainly it's proven clinical evidence and for those of you who read our report already will understand what we mean by proven clinical evidence. Um, what will be really driving I think uh, partnership activity, driving funding and therefore driving the scaling of ventures is where that particular digital venture is focusing its capabilities. What I mean by that is that pain points in value chains are increasingly going to be driving scaling and driving innovation. And to illustrate that, the couple of examples, Pharmacos, their biggest pain point is their product pipeline. The innovation in R&D, or particularly R in pharma, is woeful. There are one or two exceptions, Novo Nordisk, which was briefly last year, last week, uh, Europe's most valuable company. That is definitely uh, seeing uh, focus from most pharmacos. And so we'll see increasing focus on bioinformatics, omics, and of course, the uh, dreaded AI that everyone talks about. I don't think I've seen quite so many websites adding the word generative AI to their websites just to sort of get picked up by the Google SEO. But that's, I think, where the pain point pharmaco is. And that's why I think we'll start you continue seeing a, uh, a focal point. The other example is health systems, US as well as health systems uh, in uh, in Europe, but more specifically in the US because they're a different kind of breed. But there we'll see a big emphasis on diagnostics and on uh, patient sort of healthcare delivery. So it's, let's say outpatient um, again, because you know labor costs are going up, uh, labor shortage. You can't create a doctor overnight, uh, and of course uh, these health systems are needing to reallocate resources uh, to their strongest pain points, but at the same time still need to deliver healthcare. So they're looking at technology to achieve this. Uh, and for those of you who want a good insight to how the US health systems are looking at it which is a very trendy topic at the moment, then um, please feel free to download our report published at Vive last year, which is the um, CIO meeting for our health systems in the US, uh, where we took a good look at what they were doing, all for that matter, and often enough, not doing enough of. Um, I'll stop there. Is there anything you want to, to add to I think you've covered it all, moment? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Okay, cool. Well, listen, I'm also conscious that we are running out of time. So, um, no questions at the moment. I think we've answered everything that came up. Obviously, feel free to ask questions um, afterwards. Uh, you can reach us through LinkedIn, through email, etc. As I said, all our reports, including our pre reports, are all available uh, to any pro subscriber. And a pro subscriber is basically someone who's paying a minimum of a monthly license as a pro user. You can cancel anytime, so it doesn't commit you to a whole 12 months the rest of your life. Uh, but it does mean that with uh, that subscription, you can access all of our premium reports as well as, of course, our free reports. And every single one of these reports is powered by not only Health Tech Alpha, the global leading digital health data intel insights platform, but of course, members of the team like Sarah who bring life to the data. Also worth noting for you guys that the team, the Gale Growth team, will be at HLTH um, this year again, HLTH in the US. Las Vegas, 10,000 decision makers in digital health, all in the same place at the same time for four days. And so if you're there, please let us know. It'd be great to catch up. And uh, finally, but not least, um, this is being recorded. So we will be able to share with you the recording um, shortly after the we end this, uh, this briefing uh, to let you uh, share with any colleagues or other stakeholders you believe should be uh, viewing this as well. Um, one last call for questions, if there are any. If not, then um, we will call it a day for today and thank everyone for 
for their time and their questions and encourage you to um, either download our latest report, Clinical Evidence in Digital Health, uh, and or, of course, um, explore Health Tech Health for yourselves. I think that's